I'm Gary Elkan. We're here at Dallas International Film Festival. We're here with Don't Look in the Basement 2, director and producer. We've got Anthony Brownrigg, and we've got producer David Ranke. Uh, guys, um, this is such a unique film in that the history of it, obviously, not just your connection, but you know, you, you've got cast members that have come back. Mm -hmm. You've got other family, you know, Jack Bennett's son, I think, was also working on this. Or? Well, Deuce, we weren't able to get Deuce, as a matter of fact. Oh. We were trying to get Deuce on it, but I mean, schedules are sometimes difficult for this kind of a thing. But, but uh, we did have uh, a Daniel Red, who's one of the producers. Right. Uh, his father used to work with my father. His father owned the film lab PSI that developed the film for Don't Look in the Basement. And Don McGee. And Dawn McGee, who was the daughter of Bill McGee, who played Sam in the original film, she came back, and Camilla Carr from the original cast. And she's we in it. Her back. Yeah, we brought her back in a different role. And the house, the house is the same. Exactly. Yeah. Exact same house. How does the? I mean, forty years later, what? How's that experience been like being able to it, to it do was, this? It was surreal in one way, but but just perfectly natural, and it just worked like a. It's yeah. It was really it was really kind of weird because I mean there had been times over the years. It was in Tawakana, Texas, mm -hmm. uh, by the uh, Trinity Institute. It's a dormitory, and Dad shot the first movie there in 1972. And throughout the years, he'd wanted to make a sequel, and so every now and again, he would go and visit the place and take pictures because he was going to plan on something else. And so walking in there and going, oh, this is the room where Dad shot this scene. This is the room where this happened this room where that happened is really kind of spooky and for anybody else that had seen the film it's it's just like weird because the house is a real personality all its own and that really attributed a lot to the film I think yeah I mean the house kind of hmm. breathes it's you know it's a hundred over a hundred years old I think and yeah. you know the floors creak and you know the doors creak and when you walk oh, yeah. it the house sort of speaks you know so, yeah. but it was great you know, when Sam comes into it first and he's he's sitting in the room itself and he has those flashbacks, mm -hmm. that's kind of, did you guys have that moment like, you know, oh God, I've I've seen this, this exact thing, that's it, creepy. It's funny because I think almost uh, Scott Tepperman and Jim O'Reilly, yeah. when they got there, and Camilla, and a couple other people, when they hit the house, the first thing they wanted to see was, we want to see room four. Oh. We want to see where it happened. Where was the big the big ending of the first film? And there's only one room that they shot that in. And so we'd take into the room and everybody would kind of stand around and go, oh, this, is, this, is where they, this is where they mutilated her. This, oh, that's where they did the, with the thing on the, you know, so it was crazy. It was, yeah, it was really kind of neat experience for everybody involved, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was, a, we set up camp and lived there and ate there and slept there. Uh, they had a kitchen. I mean, the place is great. Jim Parker owns it and he was very gracious and mm -hmm. his, his staff was great with us. and. And we brought some chefs, and we just lived there, and slept there, and ate there, and uh, you know, and filmed there, and obviously. <laughs> so. Well, can y'all talk about that family environment? I mean, we know that Chuck. I mean, he was on Pearl. I oh mean, yeah. This this Chuck is a it's a lot of connective kings in the movie. King yeah, plays yeah, yeah, yeah. Us, yeah. We, we 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 roped King in we're, doing a camera. Well, we part. were looking for someone because uh, you know, when uh, we cast uh, Willie Minor in in the role of Sam. Uh, we had lost uh, Bill McGee hmm. to us a while back. And so we had to do a flashback, and it was like, well, we need to get someone that's in the age of the original Sam from the first film. And we looked all over the place trying to find someone, and, and eventually it was just like, well, why don't we use King? King would be perfect for that. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we brought King, and he did a hell of a job. Yeah. He really did. Yeah, but it was great. I mean, like I said, it, it was kind of a, uh, a blending of families. It's just the whole thing is weird because... You know, Tony's family and all his contacts and then a lot of people I'd worked with for the last 20 years, like Chuck Hatcher, who's just one of the most awesome DPs on the planet. Love and Chuck. Uh, um, You know, and a lot of the cast and crew, we've uh, Tony and I had worked with for years and years. Of course, it's a complete Texas cast and crew. Yeah. I mean, almost everybody in the film was from the Dallas area and had worked around here. And uh, it's kind of cream of the crop, some of the best people. I mean, people don't realize what a deep talent pool we have here in this area. Yeah. And, uh, so we're lucky, you know, we've worked with these guys over the years. And uh, and, uh, and then, of course, Danny and Tony, uh, Danny Red, the other producer, and the other, we have uh, Andrew Sinsenegg, Danny Red, and I were the executive producers. Mm -hmm. And then, but Danny's dad worked with Tony's dad back in the day. And uh, so there's just a lot of connective tissue all the way through this thing. And uh, Yeah, I've never worked on a film where everything kind of fell into place so quickly. I think the entire deal took about two hours to do. I was yeah, yeah. <laughs> Danny called me up and he's like, "Hey, I got this guy Tony uh, Brown ring in my office. Uh, we're talking about this." I'm like, "Okay, I'll come down. 
Yeah. We hashed it out in about an hour and a half or two hours. Yeah, it was. I mean, I talked about that doing it for years. And Danny and I were just talking in the office one day, and I was talking about another film or something. He goes, well, why don't you do that basement film? And I was like, yeah, okay. He says, okay, well, let, go, let me call somebody. And they got on the phone, you were over there in an hour, and it's like, okay, oh, yeah, and I know this guy, Andrew Sensenick, who I already knew. And it was and, in Corolla. <laughs> and I and I'd wanted to use in something else for a while. We talked about you know wanting to work on something together for a while. And I said, yeah, I know Andrew. I'd love to have Andrew involved. So Andrew got involved, and yeah, everything kind of fell into place like amazingly fast. And and well, everybody you, worked. you worked with uh, you know a red Victoria with yeah. uh, uh, Ariana and um, yeah. mm -hmm. Let's talk about this cast. Um, yeah. uh, I was blown away by Frank. I, my first ever interview was oh, yeah. with Frank and, and Justin, yeah. uh, Ariana's husband. And, you know, I always give him a hug whenever I see him. Yeah. There's no way in hell I'm hugging him now after seeing this. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. His character is really well fleshed out and creepy as hell. Like, he, yeah. he did an amazing job. Frank, Frank Mosley is, is, and Ariane too. Yeah. I mean, Ariane, Andrew, Frank, uh, Megan Emmerich, who's mm. still new on the scene, she co-wrote the script with me, and um, uh, then the whole rest of the community, Kim Foster and Jim uh, uh, Jim O'Rear and Scott Tepperman as the oh, as the two, yeah. They, I mean, the whole cast just kind of fell. The casting was very, very oh, fast. And, and Tony Anthony's mom, Lily, is in there, and the very first yeah, scene, the very first scene. That's and my she, mother. She, kinda, oh wow, okay. That was one of the first wow. scenes Libby we Hall. shot. It makes and sense, yeah. She, she met my father on the set of The Naked Witch. My mother is a Larry Buchanan film. Mm -hmm. My mother was The Naked Witch. And my father was a sound man. <laughs> so, so she hadn't acted in years, and she gave it up to raise me. So when we got this, it was like, well, we're shooting this thing, you know. Yeah, Tony's like, hey, I'd like to put my mom in this scene. I'm probably like, <laughs> okay, it's not a big scene. It's okay. And then there was one of the first scenes we shot, and she comes in there, and she just kills it. And, and everybody, everybody standing around is like, Oh my God! We got to. We've really got to raise the bar here. It she did. Just, she just killed it. She <laughs> came in and just blew everybody away. She's playing a patient with Alzheimer's and all this and stuff, and it's like, wow! And everybody in the cast and crew kind of got those tingles. And go, okay, this movie might actually be something really cool. So it was like, you know, it really grew from there. And yeah. I think everybody it set the tone. Cast and crew started inputting their own ideas as we were going along, and it was like, well, that's a great idea, why don't we use that? And, we'll only, and so it started growing out of just a little low-budget horror film into something that was a lot more in-depth and more character-driven. Well, even like Kim, Kim Foster's yeah. character, yeah. her little moment has yeah. a whole story in itself and right. her interacting with him, I, I love that scene, that was one of my favorite scenes, like yeah. that's, so, because you Chester, do, Chester yeah, Rushing. Oh, with yeah. The, another the hat. amazing yeah. talent. Yeah. yeah, I mean, all, even all of our, you know, secondary characters almost would try and steal the show. You oh know? my gosh, yeah, they really brought. Yeah, it. I mean, it, it, yeah, we wanted to make when 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 Emmerich and I were working on the script, we wanted to make sure that even the little cameo, there, we didn't want any just regular extras. We wanted everybody to have kind of a little bit of a moment as much as possible, as much as we could. And so, yeah, with Chester, who was fantastic, and then Kim, who was great, and then Brady, Brady McGinnis, who was in the, the smoking scene with uh, Frank. He's absolutely floored us. And, I, you know, there's and, such and, talent um, in Texas. The, um, I <laughs> the... The girl that... The, 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 She's <laughs> eating the... <laughs> Chester, um, uh, Kim, or no... Kim Kim Foster. No, Kim, uh, no the other. Uh, I'm sorry, I've, mine's gone blank. You know, uh, I'm, I've got to save the world. Um, what's her name? Um, oh my, Carol, Carolyn Kane. Carol, yeah, uh, Carolyn Kane. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. And she, so she did. A, yeah. Sorry, Carolyn. Carol That's like, Well, there's so many. It's it's hard to. I mean, there's no real, there's no person I can say is that this was just the one standout performance of the film. Everybody had their standout moments in the film. It's definitely an amazing ensemble cast. It's a big cast. It doesn't look like a big cast when you go into it, but then you realize that all these characters are going to have their moments. It didn't feel like a big cast, did it? I mean, no, it was, no, it was, but, but uh, we I had agree. barbecues you know, in the back it. at the yeah. end of the day, and it was like you know, yeah. it was it was like summer camp. Wow, it was really cool. Yeah. Well, I'm curious, what's it like being able to to be here at the Dallas International Film Festival to have basically a homecoming, if you will, uh, a chance to show it here in Texas, and you know, a lot of these people do live here in Dallas. What's that like? It's, uh, so you said it's like a homecoming. I mean, it's just fun. Um, you know, it's great that we're premiering here, and it's great that, you know, we'll have a home team behind us, but um, it really is a big family, and, you know, we're, we, we really are happy to be able to, 
to make this film that Tony wanted to make and also you know, to, to include all of our friends and, and co-workers that we really believe in and showcase their talents. So. Yeah, it's, it's a real honor. It really is a big honor and uh, Dad would, would love it. And, and Dallas just yeah. has a great film scene. That it's not as well known as a lot of other places, but there's a real deep, you know, vibrant scene here of people that are passionate and really want to show what they can do. So that's our plans. Keep doing this and do it with lots more things here. So. Is there a catharsis in being able to, you know, wrap the story and complete the story like this? I mean, it. it yes. Yeah. Dad wanted to make a sequel for years, and we talked about it. And he basically. I took all of his notes that we talked about over the years, mm -hmm. and then with, with uh, Megan Emmerich and, and then David, and of course Andrew sat in on it too, and we kind of worked out this how it's, gonna, how it's gonna complete this story 40 years later, and I incorporated a lot of the things that Dad wanted to see in the sequel, mm -hmm. and which are some important things in the, in the film, and so you know, I just, I've always had this nightmare of Dad coming up from the grave and saying, what did you do with the <laughs> film? <I> mean, <laughs> so. But I think he'd be very happy. So I'd make a good third film, your dad coming yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, that would. Hey, be, that's a good that idea. That's a good idea. We'll write that down. Yeah, and Camilla, of course, was. Well, was she's got to be. Yeah. Yeah, Camilla was fantastic. It's great to have her. Yeah. Wow. Well, I'm 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 really excited to uh, to see what the reaction of the fans because this is uh, it is creepy, it's scary, but it is it's suspenseful. It keeps you on your toes, but wanting what's going to happen. I love it. Yeah. Thank yeah. you guys Thank you. so much for. Thank you. Uh, Thank bringing the film so and thanks for making it. Really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you. We're honored much. to be here. Good to see you guys. Thank you guys. Good to see you. The following program is brought to you in part by the film Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace. Welcome to another Leon Chani report, and we have uh, sort of an eclectic show today. But first, let's talk some fundamental things with Dory Gold, who is the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations and former, like the NSA. Uh, uh, how do we compare him to uh, Berger? I guess uh, Sandy Berger. He was the man who was next to Bibi Netanyahu at security matters, his security advisor, and then he was. Uh, Moved to the United Nations, which is a very important post. Welcome, Dory. We've never had you on the show before. Thank you, Leon. Uh, you're Hartford born. Originally. Originally. Gave up your American passport? Gave it up. Nice. True Jew. Dory, the UN is a pretty active place today. First, let's talk about Iraq and Iran and that whole business. What's going on over there? Well, I think the Iraq and Iran story reminds us that the Middle East is still a very dangerous place, a place where there are existential dangers to the state of Israel. In Iran today, we are watching the growth of an Iranian missile program. Originally, the Ir Iranians tried to develop long-range ballistic missiles with the help of North Korea, but they found that working with blueprints alone, it couldn't get very far. Now they have the assistance of Russian technicians who are working to develop a, an Iranian ballistic missile program, which should give them, within a few years, the ability to strike ranges of about 1,300 kilometers, giving them basically the ability to strike Israel. But we also expect that they are working on programs to give them ranges to strike even targets in Europe and beyond. There are some indications that they're looking for an intercontinental capability. It's a nice menu for today. Iraq, Saddam Hussein, playing around with the UN. You're involved in that? Well, we watched that carefully, although the issue of UNSCOM, UNSCOM the uh, UN Special Commission, is really something the Security Council handles, and we're not part of the Security Council. Uh, it's something where the leadership position on taking care of Iraq is in the hands of the United States and the British. But, of course, it has direct implications for us. Iraq has been involved in at least three wars against Israel, with large expeditionary forces that crossed either Jordan or Syria. And Iraq, of course, struck us with ballistic missiles during the Gulf War. So to the extent to which Saddam Hussein can break out of 
these restrictions and rebuild his mass destruction weapons capability, that's something which touches on the everyday lives of every Israeli. Your gut feeling, what do you think will happen? The United States cannot uh, tolerate this, nor can they move without sanctions, well, not sanctions, but the, they have to bring the whole congregation of UN nations together like they did in the Gulf War. What's your gut feeling? Will they push them around? Well, we've seen problems in the coalition between the United States and other parties that go back already a number of years. I recall in October 1994, for example, Saddam Hussein brought massive tank forces. He concentrated large armored divisions on his southern border with Kuwait. Uh, the United States sought the help of the international community to do something about that, and basically none of the Arab partners of the United States, with the exception of Kuwait itself, not even Saudi Arabia, was willing to lift a finger. So the coalition has been frayed for a number of years, and we hope, nonetheless, that the major powers of the UN, including France and Russia, will act responsibly and make sure that he complies with Security Council resolutions. Dory, a lot of people come on the show, and uh, I'll take Abba Eben, let's say he was on the show, the former foreign minister and ambassador to the UN. He says, since the Netanyahu government came into power, you've lost a lot of relationships with uh, some of the foreign uh, nation, Arab nations, uh, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, you know, name them, uh, Morocco. Everybody is angry. Is that a true statement? There is a problem in the Arab world. I don't accept Mr. Iban's analysis. I do accept the analysis of someone like Fuad Ajami, the great uh, American... Uh, Middle East expert of Lebanese origin, who wrote in February of uh, this year, February 1997, in U.S. News and World Report, that there is a crisis in the peace process, but it goes to the fact that the peace that was made in all those great ceremonies over the last years was the king's peace or the pharaoh's peace, a peace between leaders that didn't reach out reach to the hearts of peoples below. And as a result, there's been tremendous resistance in the streets of the Arab world to this peace, and eventually the leaders have buckled under. I know in Qatar, a public opinion survey was done on peace with Israel, even before the peace process had its current impasse. And there's tremendously deep rejection of Israel in the Arab world. Tom Friedman, who I don't always agree with, wrote a column in the New York Times, also in the month of February, why it was that Prime Minister Netanyahu couldn't stop in Morocco on the way back from a U.S. visit having just completed the Hebron Agreement, a major advance in the Oslo process. And the reason was because King Hassan's domestic politics, according to Mr. Friedman, didn't permit him to do so. So there is a problem in the Arab world. In that sense, I agree with Mr. Iban, but I disagree with the analysis. I think the problem is related to the Arab world. You're right on one point. I can tell you that when they signed the Jordanian-Israeli peace treaty, I was in downtown Amman filming and I can tell you that most people in that country were not that excited about it. There was a lot of resentment against that peace treaty. There was a lot of anger. And we were nearly overwhelmed by, by, by people who tried to get to our cameras and all that. It was a pretty rough situation. So from that point of view, I would agree with you. Um, you know, it could be deemed the king's peace. But, Dory, Bibi Netanyahu walked into a government. There was an Oslo agreement signed, sealed, delivered uh, yesterday. Uh, it was two, two years since the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin. Where is Israel today in terms of that peace agreement? Well, you know, when Benjamin Netanyahu was elected Prime Minister of Israel in May of 1996, the peace process was not a blazing success. We had over 250 Israelis who were killed in various bus bombings and other types of suicide bombings in the heart of Israeli cities. We didn't have those kind of losses from Palestinian terrorism for at least a decade. So here, a decade, uh, the numbers that it would normally take a decade to lose, we were suddenly losing in three years. Uh, on our Syrian border, everyone spoke about the peace with Syria. But we had had, in 1995 and 1996, 200 Katusha rockets that rained on northern Israel in the Galilee. Two mini-wars in Lebanon. And so we had an ironic phenomenon that occurred. On the one hand, people spoke about peace. On the other hand, Israelis experienced an unprecedented worsening of their personal security. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu could have said, you know what, this peace process isn't serious. If more Israelis are dying while we're talking about peace, then it's a fraud. He didn't do that. He also refused to ignore the problems of security that were emerging. He decided on something else. He decided to take this impaired peace process 
and try and make it work. It isn't easy. The peace process is full of contradictions. Working with Chairman Arafat or with uh, President Assad is not like working with Anwar Sadat in 1977. But Prime Minister Netanyahu is determined to try and make this work with all the difficulties that we face. The Prime Minister is coming to the United States to uh, speak, I guess, at the General Assembly in Indianapolis, was it next week, or the 16th, 17th? 16th, 17th. Around that time. And uh, I was in Israel last week, and the papers were full of speculation of whether President Clinton would invite him or speak with him or meet with him, and I don't know where it is today even. And there are many people who say that for the Prime Minister to come of Israel, to come to the United States and not meet with Clinton, is sort of a, cla a slap in the face by President Clinton. Do you agree with that? Well, I know the Prime Minister has made his schedule for his trip, which will in all likelihood involve stops in Indianapolis and in Los Angeles. And uh, the White House has been informed of his schedule. Should the uh, President find the time to have a meeting, even a short meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu, that would be fine. There's a lot to talk about. If not, I'm sure the Prime Minister and the President could find a time in a future trip to meet. So you're not that concerned about it? No, I, I don't think we have to always, uh, you know, compare suntans, you know. Who got to meet the president, how many times. Uh, the president has a busy schedule. I know he'll be on the West Coast during much of that trip. And if, we can, if they can work out a time to meet, that's fine. If they can't, well, there'll be another trip. They can always set a date for the future. All right, we're going to cut for a break, and we'll come right back and talk to Ambassador Dory Gold, who is the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations. It's a, a prickly time for uh, the United Nations and for Israel at this moment, and we need his insight. We'll be right back. In modern Middle East history, only one peace treaty has stood the test of time, the 1978 Camp David Accord. In the new documentary film, Backdoor Channels, The Price of Peace, learn the true story behind the greatest diplomatic achievement of our time and its lessons for the future. The price of peace is very high to have this courageous man and my close friend killed. Winner of the Telly Award for Best Cultural Program. Now available at select stores including Barnes & Noble and online at Amazon.com. Now get the book the hit movie was based on, Leon Charney's Backdoor Channels. Learn about the Backdoor Channel negotiations that led to the historic 1978 Israeli-Egyptian Peace Treaty. Become a witness to history and order Backdoor Channels online at Amazon or Barnes & Noble. Also available at all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at iTunes or Audible.com. Relive history. Order Backdoor Channels. We're back. We're talking to Ambassador Dory Gold, Israel's United Nations representative. And uh, that's a very tough spot. Uh, we used to talk to God Yacobi a lot. You know, I, I had on uh, on this show uh, Ambassador Butler from Australia, who's now in charge of that whole uh, business in Iraq. Am I correct? Absolutely. Good man. Very He's a good, very good man. Very good man. And uh, uh, nice wife, too. Very pleasant people. Dory, let's talk about you as a person. Why, uh, 20 years ago, did you emigrate to Israel? Well, I believe I had an opportunity to be a Jew living in this time when we've uh, rebuilt the state of Israel to be part of that uh, rebirth. And uh, I wanted to contribute my strengths, whatever I could give, to the security and well-being of Israel. And... Um, when you think of the fact that our fathers and grandfathers prayed to return to Jerusalem, for me to stay on the sidelines and not be part of it, I felt was the wrong thing to do. So I came. I came to be active, not just to live in Jerusalem and do nothing, but to be part of the rebuilding of the state. You're exactly the prototype of what your president, Ezra Weitzman, wants from all Jews in the world. Azar Weitzman has told me innumerable times that uh, to him, a Zionist is a person who comes to live in Israel, a pro-Zionist is one who supports Zionists. He said that at a major convention in Atlanta, Georgia, to a bunch of Zionists. Who, and he says, to you to be, for you to be Zionist, you must have moved to Israel. you believe that's a, a fair statement? I believe all Jews can take part in the rebirth of Israel. Some of us, and I think it's a personal choice, are willing to make the plunge and actually move to Israel, become Israeli citizens, enter the uh, Israeli army, become part of Israeli society. Others can do it occasionally. There's an expression I one time heard, demi-aliyah. People have an apartment in Jerusalem but live 
in uh, the United States and come for two months, come for Chagim, for holidays. That's also legitimate. I don't want to judge people. People make personal choices. But I think we all can take part in the rebirth of Israel, and I think it can feed back to the diaspora as well and strengthen Judaism and Jewish life here as well. Was there any one incident that motivated you to take up your roots from where we in Hartford, born in Hartford, Connecticut? Well, I was born in West Hartford, Connecticut, and went to high school in Massachusetts and college in New York at Columbia. So was any one thing, a lot of people, you know, I've talked to said after the Six-Day War, they moved to Israel. This was a motivational thing for them. Uh, sometimes uh, they were uplifted for, for different reasons. It's, I'm just curious because most of our audience is curious about these types of things. Or it was just, it was your background, very Zionistic, your parents? Well, I think there were, my parents contributed greatly. But uh, I believe the question, I think for most young people growing up in the 1960s when I grew up, was how to do something meaningful with your life, how to become part of a larger whole, how to be part of what we call in, in uh, Hebrew, tikkun olam. You can do that by choosing a universal mission that has nothing to do with Judaism. You know, go protest civil rights, go protest other things, which are very important. Or you can do it within the particularism of the Jewish people. I felt that was my way of doing it. And when I'm at the United Nations speaking to other nations in the name of Israel and the Jewish people, I do it with great pride. Well, let's talk about Jews for a minute. The big item in Israel now is the conversion bill. And I read an item where you went to certain... Uh, synagogues on the holidays and certain people were not very nice about it. I'm, I'm not sure, so you tell me what happened. You went to a conservative uh, uh, congregation, is that it? Well, first of all, let's put this in the right context. Okay. Um, I think it's important that representatives of Israel go to all different, all movements, right. whether they're orthodox, whether they're conservative, whether they're reform, because all Jews are legitimate Jews. And we shouldn't take this conversion controversy and turn this into a split in the Jewish people, like between uh, Pharisees and Sadducees, and between Karaites and Rabbinites. So we should put all that aside. And I think it's important, and I therefore made the effort, and I went to different synagogues. One individual in a synagogue on the Upper West Side confronted me with some, some sort of harsh statements about why I was coming into his synagogue if I represent a country that doesn't see him and his congregation as Jewish. I'm not going to blame a whole synagogue or I'm not going to blame the conservative movement because it was a conservative synagogue for the act of one individual. And obviously, I don't know who went to the press with this story. It wasn't me. So uh, some guy was a little hot-headed and, and uh, verbally attacked a representative of the state of Israel. It happens. Not a big deal. I said to him, and I said to the other people there, it was Simchat Torah, I said, all Jews are welcome in my home. I hope I'm welcome in your home. And I walked into his shul. And it worked out? It worked out, except it was in the press. <laughs> Nobody knows who leaked it. Well, it's not a big leak. We're not talking about a uh, foreign ministry telegram. No, but it could be sensitive, because the issue is very sensitive right now. I, uh, I saw an item where uh, Ben Ali Saar, your ambassador in Washington, walked out of the reform uh, convention. Um, well, some very bad things were said by a spokesman who I don't think comes from the reform movement. But go ahead. But do you know of the incident? I read a little bit about it, but I haven't spoken to Ambassador Ben Ali Saar, so until I speak to him, I'm not going to judge it from the newspaper article. All right, let's go into the conversion bill, because it's a big item in the United States, but when I was in Israel, most Israelis were apathetic about it. They were not that concerned, and people don't understand that in this country. It's not that big a deal, even to the secular Jews in Israel. It's not that big a thing. Now, as I understand it, the, there was a status quo that was uh, initiated by David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel, which meant is basically you leave me alone, I leave you alone. We talked talk to Dr. Borg about it, Yosef Borg, last week in Israel. What happened was the reform and the conservative Jews went to the Supreme Court to try and make this a law of the land. And it's, am I correct? Or? Well, let me, I think your, your first part is absolutely correct. There was a status quo going right. back for all of Israeli history that the only conversions recognized in Israel were orthodox conversions. Right. But conversions anywhere else in the world, in Cyprus, the United States, Russia, that were reform or conservative, if they're done outside of Israel, they would be recognized. When wait, 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 wait a minute. If a person, a lot of people don't know this, I want to be very careful because they don't understand it very well. If I married a, ref, well, if a, a reform 
a Jew, a, a convert, was converted by a Reformed Jew, had a child in New York City, and the conversion took place by a rabbi in New York City who was Reformed, and they came to live in Israel, and she was married to an Israeli. She and the child will be accepted in Israel? All conversions, absolutely, all conversions now, a lot of people done outside the borders of Israel by the Reform and Conservative movement are accepted in Israel today, and it's not even part of this controversy. In fact, I'll tell you a story. When uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu was putting together his coalition agreement with the religious parties, they came to him and said, we not only want to be sure that only Orthodox conversions are recognized in Israel, we want to make sure that only conversions, only Orthodox conversions are recognized from the whole world. So that, you know, we won't be able to say that a reform conversion in the U.S. would be recognized. Prime Minister Netanyahu told the Orthodox parties, that I won't do. That is unacceptable. And they had to compromise. They had to pull back. Now, the only reason we're caught into this morass is because there was a court challenge done by certain individuals from the conservative and reform movements in Israel to our Supreme Court. Once this litigation process started, the Orthodox parties feared that the court would now rule that the status quo that for years had been there since Golda and Ben-Gurion, that this status quo would no longer be tenable. And therefore they wanted to protect the status quo with formal legislation. What the Prime Minister has been saying to everybody is, hold on, time out. You, the Reform and Conservative, Pull back your court challenge. Pull back the litigation. I will go to the Orthodox parties, and I'll get them to pull back the legislation. And in that time out, what we have to do is sit together, Jews of Orthodox background, conservative, reform, in what's called the Ne'eman Commission. Yaakov Ne'eman, the Minister of Finance. Absolutely, and try and work out a deal. But we can't put the state of Israel at tremendous risk. We can't put a, you know, a hand to the throat of the state of Israel and say, you must settle this by such a time or we're going to have a break in the Jewish people. That's untenable. There are tremendous dangers out there. People think the Middle East was more or less at peace. There are a few little pieces to put together in the peace process. That isn't true. How far is Saddam Hussein from Israel? 300, 400 kilometers? What happens when he resumes his military strength? What happens when Iran achieves a ballistic missile capable of striking us? What happens when the world sees this terrible rift in the Jewish people? How will they respond? And how will our friends in different parts of the world respond? Israel has great challenges, but Israel is willing, and the government of Israel is willing, to have this dialogue. What we have to now do is give this dialogue a chance. As they used to say, give peace a chance, give dialogue a chance. So and try and work out a deal within the Gnamon Commission. But what's the big hitch here? I mean, it sounds reasonable the way you're talking. What is the big hitch? Because if you say that there is now formal legislation that's taking the old status quo yeah. and turning it into a formal law that right. only Orthodox conversions are recognized in Israel right. in response to a court challenge, right. people can get up and say, the state of Israel says, I, as a Reformed Jew, am no longer a legitimate Jew. That is a logical leap. That isn't true, but it makes good rhetoric. In any case, it's a mistake to do that. Everyone has to pull back. Everyone has to exercise responsibility. The Reform and Conservative movements and the Orthodox movements and Orthodox parties. We are very close to the abyss. We have to pull back from the abyss. All right. Traditionally, ambassadors to the UN and council generals here, they, they, they talk to a lot of Jews in the city and the state around the area. Have you been able to convey this message to a lot of Reform and Conservative Jews? Well, this isn't my formal job, I and so I, I'm not going to but synagogues giving this lecture. But I, whenever I reach elites or speak to them or speak in large audiences, I definitely give this message, whether it's was it an APAC conference recently in Florida. I'm going to the GA. I'm supposed to speak at the end of the GA. This will be part of my message. There's but no what, what is the reaction when you do explain it? Is it do, do people accept it? I think the bulk of Jews... Uh, the bulk of the American Jewish community prefer the politics of unity over the politics of polarization. I believe most people's hearts are in trying to overcome this. People are also very hurt 
because this has been explained to them that they're not legitimate Jews. And they're very hurt. Right. I can understand that. If somebody said, I'm not a legitimate Jew, I'd be very, very hurt. If somebody said, you can't go into this synagogue, you're rejected. Of course. But that's not true. The state of Israel and the shield of Zionism are there to protect every Jew, no matter what his background is, whether he's Orthodox, Reform, or Conservative. All right, I accept what you say, but don't you think that this should be given more? I, I, no one understands it like What this. do you do, put it on an Internet site? Maybe. What do you do, you put it on a brochure? Maybe print a, print a big ad in the newspapers, just the way you lay it out, and say, look, every Jew who's converted, I, I mean, do some public relations on it. You're right, it's, it's a tragedy, because I've been in Israel, and I see what, what's going on there, and this has become an alienation process, where everybody grabs on and says, well, I'm not welcome, I'm not going to go there, I'm not going to give them money, you know, it's I'm not traveling, let's go to the Bahamas this year, not to Tel Aviv. That's right. Sure. Now, the way you present it, it seems pretty logical and, and, and fair and Jewish, and I, I don't give advice on this show. I'll, I get paid high price for my advice, but I'll do it for nothing. I'll say right now that the, uh, the State of Israel and, and the press office and the Council General should make a major campaign about what is going on, because I'm telling you, it's a real problem out there. And uh, I'm not pontificating now, but uh, you are Jewish and I'm Jewish. We both have families in Israel. We care about it. Let's talk about a happy subject, Lebanon. <laughs> What's going on over there, Dory? You know, I want to take one step back, because I made reference to uh, President Sadat, who you knew from the Camp David period. When President Sadat came to Israel to start the peace process with um, our late Prime Minister Menachem Begin, he said three words, no more wars. And that meant violence couldn't be part of the negotiating process. Correct. It was removed. Let's say you know, there was an impasse between Israeli and Egyptian negotiators, and there were plenty of impasses. You didn't suddenly find uh, two brigades of Egyptian tanks concentrated in western Sinai to send a signal to uh, Prime Minister Begin to make a concession. That didn't happen. But what's happening in uh, the whole Lebanon-Syria theater? Iranian aircraft land every few weeks, jumbo jets, in Damascus International Airport, carrying parts of Katusha rockets and other weapon systems. These weapon systems are moved from Damascus to the Bika, eastern Lebanon, where they go to the uh, forces of Hezbollah. And Hezbollah is incessantly attacking Israel, attacking us in the north, attacking our villages. As I said before, in 1995 and 1996, at the height of the peace process, 200 Katusha rockets land in northern Israel. We have an area called the security zone. In that security zone, we have stationary Israeli positions, but the area in southern Lebanon is generally under the control of the South Lebanese army. General Lachad. Right. And we are facing a lot of losses in the security zone. Now there's a question. If we pull out of the security zone, maybe Hezbollah will lose its motivation to keep attacking us. Unilateral withdrawal. There are many who think, and in fact the heads of Hezbollah have said it, that they will continue into northern Palestine, as they say, into the Galilee. The security zone was originally created to prevent infiltration. Of course, they can shoot a rocket over the security zone. The only way to solve the Lebanon problem is if Syria commits itself to disarm Hezbollah or to see that Lebanon disarms Hezbollah the same way other militia in Lebanon were disarmed right after the Taif Accords of 1989. It's untenable that the Christians have to disarm, the Druze have to disarm, but Hezbollah doesn't disarm. So what, that is the way, that is the key to making a settlement in Lebanon. If the uh, Hezbollah disarms, we can create security arrangements that would allow Israel to take a more flexible position in southern Lebanon. That is the key for breaking out of this process, but it requires a Syrian decision. And it requires also the international community to tell Syria that using Hezbollah terrorism against Israel is not a way to advance the peace process. You don't advance peace with violence. You advance peace with peace. Well, I'll confirm what Sadat said. I know it factually, and I've been there, and I've heard it. And it was true. Uh, what you're dealing with is a totally different uh, bag of worms, shall we say. Do you think, by the way, Dory, do you think that the Netanyahu government, especially your prime minister, gets fair press in the United States? Well... You know, if you come from the liberal side of the political spectrum, you have your complaints against the press, and if you come from the conservative side, you have your complaints against the press. I know that when conservative politicians often get elected, 
in the United States in 1980, Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States. Everyone said this is going to be a disaster. Soviet-American Cold War renewed. Well, Ronald Reagan ended the Cold War. We were one time in Bonn, Germany, and we met with uh, Helmut Kohl, the Chancellor of Germany. And he said, yes, I come from the CDU, the Christian Democratic Union, and when my party replaced the Schmidt Socialist Party, everyone said, it's the end of peace in Europe, it's going to be unstable, we have a right-wing government in Germany, it's going to be a disaster. Well, Schmidt, excuse me, Kohl was a part of those arrangements that brought an end to the Cold War. And when another Israeli by the name of Menachem Begin was elected Prime Minister in 1977, I remember Newsweek magazine, front page, Day of the Hawks, banner headline, and of course Begin brought peace with Egypt. I think Prime Minister Netanyahu was going to surprise a lot of people. But until those agreements are reached with these very tough peace partners, he's going to get a bad press. All right, Doria, we'll hold for a break and we'll come right back. I'm going to ask you how tough it is for the Prime Minister to be involved with Yasser Arafat because really he, when he ran for uh, Prime Minister, I think he said he wasn't really going to speak to Yasser Arafat. So we'll come back and ask you. Okay. Leon Charney sets out to discover the true meaning of the Kaddish, the Jewish custom of reciting a prayer to commemorate the death of a close relative. Join Charney as he finds out the history of the Kaddish and how it has evolved. Reviewed as a refreshing walk through Jewish history and a book that deserves to be read by both Jews and non-Jews, The Mystery of the Kaddish is now available online at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all other retailers and booksellers. Or download the audiobook at audible.com or on iTunes. Discover The Mystery of the Kaddish. Get best-selling author Leon Charney's latest book, The Battle of the Two Talmuds. Join Charney as he explores years of Jewish history to find out why and how Talmudic scholars and rabbis abandoned the Holy Land for the lands of the Diaspora. Learn about the power struggles behind the creation of the Jerusalem and Babylonian Talmuds. It's a book critics call engaging and enlightening, a book which will be of interest to people of every faith. Now available at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, or download the audiobook of The Battle of the Two Talmuds at iTunes or Audible.com. We're back. We're speaking to Dory Gold, uh, who makes a strong case for his government. He's the uh, Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, American-born, and emigrated about 20 years to Israel. Perfect prototype of what we consider a Zionist, or at least Asa Weitzman does. Dory, uh, your prime minister campaigned on uh, a very strong issue, was that he really didn't want to talk to Yas Arafat, if I recall. And then uh, this famous handshake at the White House and the fact that he, you know, he has to talk to him. What's your take on that? Well, I think this shows how far the Prime Minister has gone. He actually stated prior to the elections that he would meet Mr. Arafat if it was important for Israeli security, not because he relished the idea, not because he was into a love fest with the PLO, but because there was a reality out there that he had to deal with. But he moved from that position to doing the accord on Hebron, which many people forget, which wasn't done by the previous government. He went on from that to talking about a program for final status called Alone Plus, which sounds very much like a program of territorial That's compromise. That's Yigal Alon, the former foreign minister in the Labor Party who had a plan of how to solve the Palestinian issue. Yes, on the basis of territorial compromise. So he has taken his party and the uh, conservative side of the Israeli political spectrum pretty far from a rejection of Oslo to talking about a lone plus. And I think this has not at all been appreciated in the United States and elsewhere in the world. I think instead uh, there's been a kind of mantra of an Israeli intransigence that's picked up automatically. It was done to Golda, it was done to Menachem Begin. And it's being done to Prime Minister Netanyahu. It's unacceptable and it's not true. Anybody who knows what really has been going on on the ground. Do you think chemistry between leaders is important in making foreign policy? We know that there's not a great chem, as you say it, the, between Netanyahu and Arafat. You think that if there were a better chemistry, it would help? Well, our late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Mr. Arafat weren't kissing cousins either. No, I can swear to that. I brought the first. Uh, uh, greetings from Yasser Arafat to Yitzhak Rabin. He was not very excited about it. No, not at all. Uh, I think what makes leaders click, I think there's two things. One, what are their interests? And second of all, their ability to deliver. If Yasser Arafat says to Prime Minister Netanyahu, I need to use my aircraft for certain reasons. I need to have a certain, I have certain needs. I need to uh, have uh, certain access in the international community or I need certain favors. 
and you respond and you can deliver those favors. And it's reciprocal. I need information on Israeli soldiers missing in action, and the Palestinians can deliver on that. That creates the confidence to proceed. You know what happened to us? Because I know I was the first envoy of the, of the Netanyahu government sent to Yasser Arafat. I will never forget March 9, 1997. There was a meeting between Mr. Arafat and the leaders of Hamas and other uh, Palestinian organizations, opposition organizations. And we know from our intelligence sources that those leaders walked away with a clear impression that they had a green light from Mr. Arafat to, to resume terrorist attacks against us. So when you talk about chemistry, how do we live with that? How do we cut a deal? How do we work when he know, we know he's been giving clear orders? And our intelligence branch tells us that. So you know what we do? We don't give up on the process. But we ask that world pressure be applied on Mr. Arafat to behave like Anwar Sadat, to reject violence as part of the peace process. Instead, people are talking about putting pressure on Prime Minister Netanyahu. But the pressure has to be placed on Mr. Arafat to prevent the violence, to prevent the bus bombings and the killing of innocent Israelis. If the pressure is put there, we can make the peace process work. If the pressure is put on us, Mr. Arafat will get the wrong idea, and I'm afraid many Israelis will die. So, Dor, can you explain this to me? That how come the Rabins are so close to Arafat today? I saw Yuval Rabin, uh, the Prime Minister, the late Prime Minister's son, wrote an article yesterday about bringing Arafat close. Did you see that in New York Times? It was. Uh, what happened over there? Why is this massive uh, love of uh, Yas Arafat now by the Rabin family? I don't want to address the Rabin family. I just understand the policies and the viewpoints of our late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. What people, what families decide to do afterward is, of course, a personal matter and their their complete right to do so. Okay. The Jordanian relationship after the fiasco or whatever it was in, in Jordan, how's it going? Jordan and Israel are tied with mutual strategic interests that go back many years. You know, making peace with Jordan was like making peace with a strategic ally, not with a former adversary. Jordan is a country surrounded by very large, stronger neighbors. To the north, Syria, which has been, uh, over the years, sponsoring terrorist penetrations of Jordanian territory from Syria in order to cause uh, terrorist acts inside Jordan itself. To the east, Saddam Hussein, who was once a partner of Jordan, but ever since about uh, 1995, became far more hostile to Jordan, and there have been firefights on the Iraqi-Jordanian border. To the south, Saudi Arabia, an old rival of the Hashemite throne, and not willing to really come to terms with Jordan in the proper way that most of us would like in the West. And therefore, Jordan, surrounded by these more difficult and hostile neighbors, has always had a special relationship with Israel. I think that special relationship and those mutual interests will endure despite the uh, mishap that... Uh, it reportedly occurred in Jordan. Now, let me ask you a question. When you were sitting outside the government, uh, were you a professor, Dory? Is that it? Well, I worked in a think tank for 10 years, a strategic studies think tank that had been under the um, uh, directorship of Major General Aron Yariv, formerly head of Israeli military intelligence during the Six-Day War. Aron Yariv, in case you didn't know, was a, was a terrific guy and a great intelligence uh, personality. And he was my teacher. Good, yeah, good teacher. Uh, so you're sitting there in this think tank, and you became friendly with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. The day the Oslo agreements were signed, what was your reaction? I had closely followed the talks with the Palestinians. I'd been an advisor to the Madrid, uh, to the Israeli delegation at the Madrid Peace Conference in '91, and to the subsequent talks in Washington. You were in Madrid. I was in Madrid. Me too. Uh, well, but the then deputy. We for starved, Dory. There was no. There's only potato chips and Pepsi. <laughs> the then, the then <coughs> deputy foreign minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, took me along with him, and um, he was a big star at that yes. conference. And I remember reading the Oslo Accords, and I was very dismayed. But I understood the motivation to do Oslo. Israel had been bogged down in the Intifada, had been bogged down in a status quo that was untenable. And our late Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin had the courage to try and break out of this with something new, thinking that over time, if there were mistakes in the, in the agreement, and he said there were holes in the agreement, we could plug those holes. But what was important was to break through, to give a, create a new reality. And I think I think he was right, and he was visionary to do it. But 
there were still problems. And once we saw that our security situation so seriously deteriorated as Oslo was implemented, we knew that we had to modify Oslo to make it tenable. All right. Hear me out for one minute. The day that Yitzhak Rabin uh, entered into the Oslo Agreement, if he would have said to Arafat, look, you strike your covenant against me the same day that I sign, or I recognize you as an entity, and then we go and we talk in Geneva for five years, you don't think that could have worked out better than what you did now? What you did is you gave people land without an economic infrastructure. And well, we also put <coughs> a military force right. next to Israel That's without right. a final status agreement. Right. So that military force becomes part of the equation, right. part of the leverage of the Palestinian side, which is a dangerous situation. There's no question about it. We're trying to contain that and improve that situation. But that was the situation we inherited. There's another thing. The Oslo Accord is built on doing easy things first and putting off harder things for later. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, that's the final status. But even in the interim status, creating a Palestinian airport, that's what's being discussed in Washington recently, a Palestinian airport with Israeli security uh, checks. You've got to make sure that when planes land, cargo ships, the cargo planes, that they don't have containers full of shoulder-fired missiles or parts of Katusha rockets. Those are great risks. Those issues are much harder than the initial Oslo issues. So no wonder the Oslo process looks like it's getting stuck or it's at an impasse, because you're moving from easier issues to more difficult issues. All the tough stuff was put off for the end, and that end is the period in which Prime Minister Netanyahu is in power. I can confirm that because I heard that from senior aides of Shimon Peres, and that was a theory. Uh, last question, I'll let you go. Um, as many people think that the Oslo Agreement leads to a Palestinian state. Explain to me, if you can, the difference between a full autonomy and a Palestinian state. Now, I'm saying a state without a foreign ministry, without a defense ministry. So let's take the Netherlands Antilles. What's the difference? Well, you do get into hair splitting here, but I think the most important thing to look at is rather than the name of the entity, the powers of the entity. There is not an Israeli Air Force commander or ex-commander who believes Israel can give up control of the airspace over the West Bank. Do you know of a state without an airspace? No. There is no one who believes that Israel can give up control of the eastern slopes of the West Bank facing the Jordan River and our eastern front because perhaps in five years' time, Saddam's army will be put back into shape and it's 36 hours away from the Jordan River. You need to have a defensive force there which is reinforced by IDF reserves in order to protect the state of Israel. You need early warning stations on the hilltops of the West Bank to pick up hostile aircraft or in the future missiles coming at Israel. And therefore, we have very specific security needs. We cannot have a situation where in that sensitive area of the West Bank, which is next to 70% of our population and 80% of our industrial infrastructure, in that area, the Palestinians or any Palestinian self-governing authority can make a military alliance with Iraq and Iran. So there are obvious limitations. There are obvious powers that can be given to the Palestinians, but there are also powers that cannot. I suggest that we sit down with the Palestinians and honestly present our case. These are things we can do and these are things we can't do. And when we're finished working out the powers, we'll get down a political lexicon and we'll give it a name. But to give it a name first, to call it a state, that becomes an envelope in which many powers can be given to the Palestinians, which they can rightfully demand as a state, which will threaten the security of Israel. Because, you see, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is not a conflict between two peoples on an island in the Indian Ocean. Where the Palestinians are demanding self-determination is in territory that is vital for the defense of Israel against coalitions of Arab armies that have historically struck Israel at least three or four times from our eastern front. That's the puzzle we have to solve in final status talks. I am optimistic in the long run. I believe we can cut a deal. I did Camp David. I'll leave Oslo to you. Thanks for coming on, Thank and you. you're welcome anytime, Dory. Thank you. We'll be back after a break. You think the Middle East is tough? We're going to bring on the Minister of Economy for the country of Croatia. See how that works.
Available now over iTunes, Amazon, and Google Play. Leon Charney's cantorial CD in Disco Lam. Listen as Charney movingly sings El Mole Rachamim and Charney's amazing rendition of a disco remix of Adon Olam, all sung in the incredible and individual Charney style. Also listen to the CDs on Rhapsody. Download Leon Charney's cantorial songs in Disco Lam, the disco remix of Adon Olam on Amazon, iTunes, and Google Play. Or listen in on Rhapsody, all available now. We're back. A uh, big area in the world has been uh, Bosnia, Croatia, Yugoslavia, and uh, personally, uh, it's a fascinating area. And a lot of us don't understand it very well, so we invited the Minister and, uh, of, economic, of Economy or Economic Planning of uh, Croatia to come in and talk with us, and his name is uh, Ninad Borges. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Mr. Borges? You pronounce it fantastically. Really? Yes. Welcome right, to the show. Thank you. Croatia is about four and a half million people. Its capital is Zagreb, and uh, you went through a very tough time recently, obviously. How's the country doing today? Quite well, taking into consideration the first a couple of years of our independence. Let be reminded that uh, after 91, uh, after the dissolution of Yugoslavia and establishing independence, we were really target of aggression, and we succeeded despite all odds. To defend ourselves and starting with 93 we started to rebuild country and to rebuild confidence to rebuild economy and to establish basement for a brighter f future what's the economy based on in croatia <clears throat> uh, let me make you understand uh, gdp breakdown of 96 was 60 percent services mainly tourism construction transportation 30% industry and 10% agriculture. If we are speaking about industry, main industries are shipbuilding, maybe chemical processing, textile, wood processing, food processing. Uh, tourism is on rapid, uh, rapid uh, track to regain, yes, to regain confidence because certainly for risk perception, Croatia was not a desirable uh, site to be visited yeah, in right. early stages of independence, but last year... Only if you're a reporter. Mm, yes, unfortunately. But that was fortunate as well, you know, because headline news has brought uh, attention to the region and specifically to Croatia, and I think that it uh, sidewise contributed to knowledge. Not completely. There are certain blanks to be filled on understanding what Croatia is. Uh, What's the major religion in Croatia? It's Catholicism, actually. Uh, you should be reminded that in the uh, fourth century of Common Era, the division line between Eastern Roman Empire and Western Roman Empire uh, was actually across uh, boundaries between uh, Serbia, Bosnia, and Croatia, uh, Slovenia and Croatia, and parts of Bosnia being in Western Roman Empire and the rest of former Yugoslavia was under Eastern Roman Empire, what later on became division line between uh, Greek Orthodox Church and Catholic Church. But when you were born, you were a citizen of Yugoslavia. That's true. I was born in 46. I was a citizen of Yugoslavia, yes. Uh, I was a citizen of Republic of Croatia. I was born in Republic of Croatia as part of that time Yugoslavia. How bad was uh, Marshal Tito, or how good was he? You know, nobody's perfect, and we could not <laughs> judge in, in terms of black or white. He was a human being. He contributed to maybe better understanding. He, he was trying to put human face on socialism of his own invention. To some extent, uh, obviously, he has had vices. Uh, he has postponed crisis in Yugoslavia. He was... Uh, he was uh, Maverick, he, he really succeeded to postpone crisis, and actually crisis uh, was visible uh, almost a decade after his death. By borrowing, by uh, presenting both sides, that means uh, Moscow and Washington, pretty face, he succeeded in his maneuvering. Is there peace now in the region? Yes, I think uh, basically if we are speaking about stability, yes, it is obtained. It's uh, it's it. It's not any more war risk or something like spillover, in fact, but uh, there is a long road, maybe bumpy road, towards uh, total stability in uh, neighboring Bosnia, and that's our major concern because uh, you should understand that the longest frontier we have is actually with Bosnia. Do you have any relationships with Bosnia? Yes, we do. 
We are signatories of Washington and Dayton agreements, which actually brought peace to the whole region. Holbrook, Mr. Holbrook. Yes, sure tough negotiator. Uh, I have met him, I think, only once. I was not directly involved in those uh, negotiations. I admire his persistence, uh, his specific style in diplomacy, but obviously the so style use brings... Him now. He's a, he's a finance, investment banker now, isn't he? Yes, but he is still involved, I think, in, in, uh, in the region, actually, over uh, President Tujman and Izetbegovic meeting in Split last summer. Uh, Mr. Holbrook was there and Gelbart. So, yes, as investment banker, I would be uh, more happy to meet him and discuss possibilities for economists' mutually beneficial projects in Croatia. In a very simplistic way, because a lot of people in the United mm -hmm. States don't understand it, what caused that conflict, that terrible conflict between uh, Bosnia and Croatia, etc.? Century long idea of. Uh, some circles in Belgrade, some it's circles in Serbia about uh, establishing greater Serbia. Unfortunately, of course, I'm not blaming uh, everybody in Serbia or Serbian people, but uh, those ideas being developed somewhere by the late 19th century were very well hidden and alive all along Yugoslavia, supremacy of uh, Serbian people in police, in army, in politics, in diplomacy. Uh, caused this fracture and caused all other people, uh, including Macedonians, including Croats, including Slovenes, including Muslims, feeling deprived of their right, rights and uh, they were just exploiting something what was given by constitution of uh, 1974, former Yugoslavia, and that is right to opt for a referendum and to opt for independence. Uh, after we have done that, firstly Slovenia, then Croatia, unfortunately, uh, Serbian controlled Yugoslav army attacked. But wasn't it really a conflict between the religious factors there? Because I don't believe in that. You don't think I so? don't believe in that. Uh, underlying reality is a rational uh, dream about greater Serbia and about constant supremacy. Of course, uh, you could interpret it uh, in the way you, you try to, because uh, actually uh, some major players uh, are divided by religions, but I don't think that any religion pray. Uh, or offer hatred and that people acted as uh, out of religious differences. How good are your foreign reserves now? Do you have much foreign reserves? Farm? Foreign, foreign re reserves. Actually, uh, I'll remind you that uh, foreign currency reserves were stolen by Belgrade in the very beginning. I know. Uh, we were left with zero. And I'm proud to say that uh, by August of this year, Central Bank of Croatia has had over 2.5 billion U.S. dollars hard currency reserves. If I'll add uh, commercial bank hard currency reserves, it uh, adds up to over 5 billion, so what's equaling our outstanding foreign debt. It's pretty good. It is. It's excellent. So it's a good place to invest. I think it is, because Croatia is on fast track, regaining position we have had prior to the uh, whole crisis broke out. Uh, last year we have had uh, somewhere below 5% real GDP growth rate. This year we expect in years to come over 7%. We have macroeconomic stability, uh, low inflation for three consecutive years, the lowest in inflation of all transitional economies of Central Europe low budget deficit. Last year it was below 1%, this year 2%. We have uh, debt, foreign debt to GDP servicing ratio of around 25%, what's again the lowest the ratio of that kind in Pretty Central stable, Europe. very stable. Yes, it is. I think that we achieved... Uh, are you looking for American investment? Yes, we are. We are looking uh, for con continuing good relations because uh, actually, some American companies are already exposed uh, investing in, in Croatia. For example, uh, Bankers Trust uh, has invested in, uh, in Croatia uh, quite impressively over the last couple of years. Uh, some of major investment bankers and houses were... I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what Americans look for. A good judicial system? Uh, it's in place. And a good banking system? Uh, it's close to be finalized. Out of 62 banks in Croatia, 55 are, pri are privatized, out of which seven are branches or subsidiaries of major European banks. Unfortunately, uh, not American banks yet. They'll come in, don't worry. American banks like to run around a little bit. Citibank will like be in there. Like cavalry at the Citibank will be in there before you know it. And the third thing they look for is a stable political situation. It is stable. 
it is stable. Uh, all three, I think, uh, preconditions. I'm not advertising, I'm not preaching, I'm trying to present to our viewers facts. I think that uh, political stability is in place. It depends to some extent what's going to happen in Bosnia, but nothing of uh, brutal nature could explode there. Uh, to make it may, maybe uh, like anecdote, uh, in a standard tango you need two, in Bosnia you need three because you have federation on one hand and you have a Serbian entity. But I think that uh, confidence building measures are bearing fruit and uh, it's visible. That you have point. a parliamentary government. Yes, and we have three branches, uh, judiciary, So you follow the American example? To some extent. You have a president. Yes, we do have, but that's not the kind of presidential system you have. Uh, we have, uh, as well, a uh, prime minister. It's closer to, Is let's call it French, French model. Right. And uh, the prime minister is part of the legislative process and it can be brought down, the government uh, vote of no confidence? Yes, quite certainly. Quite certainly, and, and you're uh, part of the government, obviously. Yes, I am. You I'm appointed. Uh, I'm appointed. Basically, prime minister is mandatory, and he uh, he suggests to president members of his cabinet. You don't have to be a member of the parliament. No, not really. And how many members in your parliament? Uh, we have two counties. We have uh, we uh, two uh, two parts. We have uh, let's call it. House of Counties, which has approximately 100 representatives, and we have uh, so-called House of Representatives with 130 and uh, 130 and four representatives. And can you bring a vote of no confidence against the Prime Minister, and they change it? Yes, and and cabinet. Yes, uh, it, it's quite uh, quite uh, quite possible, uh, although it hasn't happened yet. And your president is uh, is he command the armies? Is he the Commander-in-Chief, like in the United States? Yes, but it's filtered down through uh, Chief of Staff and to Minister of Defense as well. But it, it is close to the system uh, you have in the United States. The, uh, the United States is helping you, the government, our government. Do they help you at all economically? Uh, do they try and build it up? Without offense, you know, I think that Croatia is not asking for help, but for partnership and for mutually beneficial, beneficial projects at corporate level. But I have to commend the uh, U.S. government. Yes, we were helped in uh, different facets uh, in uh, bringing or speeding up the democratic changes uh, in, in uh, society and system we have inherited from former communist or socialist system. So you're a democratic uh, country right we now. We wish to believe that we are on good path to develop for fresh Tell me democracy. personally for you, you were born in a communist country. Yes. When did you get your democracy? How old were you? Personally? Yeah. Uh, Family-wise, uh, from the very beginning of my uh, remembrance. Uh, really? I I within family. Outside, uh, you know, being a kid of... Uh, 10 or 14, you do not recognize what the differences are between genuine democracy and system you were living in. You wish or tend to believe that that's the best world you are living in, in your adolescence. You're absolutely right. A lot of Americans don't understand that. You know, when I was in Russia in the 70s, and the uh, people that I met there, they felt comfortable because the communism was taking care of their apartments, their homes, their, you know, the whole way it went. There is they didn't know anything different. You know what changed everything? The satellite. Uh, the communication, 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 global right. village. Global village. That's I do agree with together. you. When you see that somebody is living better or could have better chances for education, for standard, for whatever. The KGB, who was around me all the time, asked me for two things. Levi's jeans and Frank Sinatra records and Elvis Presley uh, <laughs> records also. So I knew that the place was going to collapse. But I have, again, uh, maybe uh, with due apology, uh, to, s to jump in and to say that... Uh, even within Yugoslavia, this northern republic, Slovenia, Croatia, not only maybe, but we were closer to uh, West European countries. Uh, we were not as closed as the uh, rest of communist world. Uh, we have had our passports. We have uh, traveled abroad. First time I traveled abroad, I was maybe 13 or 14. What did your father do? My father was pharmacist. You're a gentleman and a scholar, and uh, we hope your country really does well. It's a pleasure to have you on. Is this your first time in New York? You've been here many times. Uh, no, I've been a couple of times in Big Apple, and I enjoy it every time I visit it again, although it's only hit-and-run visit.
Mr. Minister, thanks for coming on Thank and illuminating much. us about uh, Croatia. A lot of people don't know a lot about it, and I hope they'll know more. And if you have a chance, visit Zagreb. You'll meet a man like uh, the minister here. And he says it's a great place for tourism. We'll see you next week. Please come.